Welcome to our uh, talk this evening on our equity, justice, and inclusion evening. <clears throat> and um, it is my pleasure to host this event that we do annually around equity, justice, and inclusion and celebrate our alumni. Tonight's program is being recorded. Feel free to use the chat function to engage in a discussion during the talk and also pose questions that Associate Professor Christina Matz will take up with the invoice and our special guest. Professor Matz will be the moderator and engage uh, Dean Boyson after his talk. And as I said, she'll sub subsequently take your questions. Now tonight's keynote presentation also qualifies for 1.25 continuing education contact hours. And if you're interested in receiving CEU credit for your attendance this evening, please reach out to Jordan McGurk and Tom Walsh by email after the event. You will be asked to complete a survey verifying your attendance. After completing the survey, you will receive an appropriate certificate of completion that is approved. Before I introduce uh, our keynote speaker, I am Gautam Yerema, for those of you who do not know me. I'm the Dean of the School of Social Work, and it's my privilege to be starting off this event. Now, it's my distinct honor, pleasure to invite my fellow Dean, Professor Voisin, Dexter Voisin, who is now currently the Dean of the Factor Inventosh Faculty of Social Work since 2019. He is also the holder of the Sandra Rotman Chair in Social Work. Prior to being at the University of Toronto, he was professor at the School of Social Service Administration at the University of Chicago for two decades, where he was a faculty affiliate at the Center for the Study of Race, Culture, and Politics, and the Center for Health and the Social Sciences. You begin to see his pedigree. It's varied, transdisciplinary, but rooted in social work. He was also the director of the SDI H HIV Intervention Network, SHINE, and co-director of the Chicago Center for H HIV Elimination. The central focus of Dean Voison's scholarship is examining the impact of structural neighborhood and police violence on the life chances and behavioral and health trajectories of racialized youth and the factors that mitigate poor outcomes in the presence of such adversities. His research has informed public policy in the state of Illinois, is noted as one of the most influential and cited black scholars in top tier schools of social work in North America. He has published more than 150 peer reviewed publications and secured over $10 million in research funding. His latest project, a book entitled America, the Beautiful and Violent, Black Youth and Neighborhood Trauma in Chicago was published by Columbia University Press in August, 2019. Dean Voisin also has considerable post MSW clinical experience. That's when I say considerable, 28 years in the areas of substance abuse, adult psychopathology, and adolescent family therapy. He has a BA from St. Andrews College and MSW from the University of Michigan and a PhD from the Columbia University School of Social Work. Now you know the right person that is in our midst to talk about anti-racist social work tonight. And the right person for us to kick off the Black you know, History Month, but also to continue. I mean, we in the school I know don't think of just February as the Black History Month. We're celebrating throughout the year with our EJI um, uh, work that we're doing where over 80 to 90 of you are, are involved. 
But let me turn it over uh, to Dean Voisin <clears throat> for his talk and then to Professor Tina Match. So thank you so much, Dean Adama. I'm truly honored, grateful, and humble for this um, invitation to be a speaker at this important event. My understanding is that you have a snowstorm coming your way. So I hope folks stay warm and, and, and safe and healthy during this time. And I'd also like to thank the organizing committee, uh, 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 Professor Matz and other colleagues um, who've worked tirelessly behind the scenes in order to make this event a possibility. So I see this as a conversation among colleagues today. So I'm really encouraging you to put your, your questions in the chat box. And I'm particularly looking forward to the last 25, 30 minutes of our time together where we could engage collectively in a discussion around some of these issues. Um, so I have some expertise, some insights. I have blind spots and biases. And I hope that collectively we could advance this, this shared conversation. I also want to thank you for the good work that I know you've been doing behind the scenes over the past several months um, uh, to, to really advance the conversation around a more inclusive environment within your school. So I, I want to thank all the folks who've been working tirelessly uh, to help move that along. Okay, so if you can get out my PowerPoint slides up now. Jordan? Jordan? Dean, you'll, you'll have to hit the share screen on your side. Okay, hold on. Okay. So my talk today is honoring our common humanity, overcoming anti-Black racism in social work education. And folks might say, well, mm, these two sections, how do they go together honoring our common humanity while at the same time overcoming anti-Black racism in social work? And I was really deliberate about this title because it really signals that we are all um, charged with an opportunity to move this conversation forward, but we are all at the same time charged with limitations based on the nature of who we are, based on growing up in North America, living in, in a predominantly white society around a white narrative. So it's something that we're all challenged by in terms of our common humanity. Yet at the same time, a common ability and responsibility to move this dialogue forward. So in my brief overview today, I'm going to situate my identity, some of my identities in terms of the framing of this talk. Uh, say a little bit in terms of what I mean by white supremacy and anti-black racism. I think very often when these words get thrown around, there's a lot of different interpretations and fear and anxiety around white supremacy, anti-black racism. And I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by the use of these terms. And then I'll situate white supremacy in America and pr pr predominantly in social work. I'll talk about some of the limitations of e using an EDI lens to address anti-Black racism. And then some of the common sense, systemic as well as localized strategies for moving away from performative to transformative um, interventions to really addressing this. Now, why focus on anti-Black racism? I can hear someone asking me. You know, in social work, we, we deal with a lot of different types of racisms and inequality. And the reason why I'm focusing particularly on anti-Black racism is because how Blackness intersects with many of the types of social inequalities we care about and we address or attempt to ameliorate in social work. So for example, you could think about Islamophobia, homophobia, uh, anti-Semitism, uh, sexism, all of these different types of inequalities, once you intersect them with a black identity, uh, the experience is uniquely different. So this evening, I'm going to focus partic particularly on a particular type of racism that I call anti-black racism, right? So arguably the experience of a white Muslim is very different than the experience of a black Muslim. 
the experience of a black Jew is very different than the experience of a white Jew. If you go to Israel and you look at the social outcomes of Ethiopian Jews living in Israel, you find a disproportionate number of individuals dealing with homelessness, mental illness, um, social disease, lots of the similar types of challenges that we are, uh, we are confronted with in the United States. If you look at groups that are LGBTQ, social outcomes, health outcomes are disproportionately different for folks who are markedly identified as Black. So I'm going to talk about anti-Black racism, particularly as it intersects with some of these other types of racisms and inequalities. So let me situate my identity because my identity says a lot in terms of my viewpoint, my biases, and how I come to this work. So this is a picture of my mother when she was younger and my siblings. I'm the last of, of three siblings. And I was born in the West Indies, but I was taught from an early age by my mother, the importance of cultural pride. And she didn't say, hey, Dexter, I'm teaching you cultural pride, but she transmitted this to me. She'd often say, Dexter, before you leave the house, make sure your hair is combed, your clothes look its very best, and your shoes are shined. So she taught me about how to present myself to the world and be proud in terms of my physical appearance and my physical presentation to the world. At the same time, she also taught me by her words that whiteness was superior. So my mother, a product of her colonization and her parents' colonization in a British colony learned that, was taught that whiteness was superior. And how did she do that? She would often say to me, when, when, when you have children and I have grandkids, I want kids with soft hair, with fairer skin, right? So at the same time, she was teaching me both cultural pride and advancing the notion of white supremacy culture. Now, why did I offer this example? I wanted to just offer this example because although we are individuals that are committed to social and racial justice and inequality, it doesn't mean that we are excluded from at the same time also holding attitudes that promote white ideology, culture or superiority, right? That many of these things can exist sometimes in conversation or in contradiction to each other. And the importance of us as social workers, as individuals in positions of power, while we do this work to continue to unpack our own socialization and normalization to white ideology culture. So let me say a little bit in terms of what I mean by white supremacy and anti-black racism. But before I do that, I want to draw attention to, to, um, to some of the highlights that were very evident to us um, early this year with the storming of the Capitol building, right? And we saw images in terms of police officers assisting individuals, um, taking selfies with individuals who had stormed the Capitol building. And this is not the only narrative of that experience, but there was very often a more kinder, gentler response to those individuals compared to the individuals in the Black Lives Matter uh, protest on June 1st, 2019, when they were pepper sprayed, um, tear gas, and there was a lot more of a violent response to those individuals. So the takeaway message to this is, in part, there are many takeaway messages, but part of the message is that if you support the equal advancement of Blacks in the United States, regardless of whether or not you are Black or white, that you will be treated to a similar degree to Blacks are treated in terms of second-class citizenship in the United States. That was one of the important takeaways. So lots of folks have, have made commentary, including President Biden, about the stark response to the Capitol insurrectionists and the Black Lives Matter 
uh, peaceful protesters and the treatment and handling by the police officers and law enforcement. So I wanna talk a little bit in terms of some key terms, what I mean by white supremacy, ideology and culture, white supremacy as a structure and white supremacists as a noun. And also a parallel framing in terms of racism as an ideology and culture, racism as a structure and being racist as a noun. And I wanna put that up there because I think very often conversations, productive conversations around moving the dial on some of these issues are stalled by the fact that people are scared, they're petrified to be called a racist. They're petrified to be called a white supremacist. But I want to encourage us to sort of take away the noun and look at it as a culture and an ideology that all individuals, whether they're black, white, Latinx, Asians, that we are all socialized to contribute to and to support. And by very often our everyday actions in the academy, outside of the academy, in the media, how we frame research, how we approach our teaching, how we look at admissions policies can very often advance white supremacy culture or it could dismantle white supremacy culture. And white supremacy culture, the existence of white supremacy culture on the other end represents black exclusion. And again, I'm focusing primarily in terms of black and brown bodies here, but anti-black racism exists because white supremacy culture exists, right? So we're looking at it at a continuum. So I really wanna focus on the structure and the ideology. So like my beautiful brown mother, she also perpetuated the ideology, although she had cultural pride and she was teaching me that. She was also teaching me notions of white ideology culture, right? So I, I wanna sort of hold these two spaces to be equally true at the same time. And it's also equally true for social work and for many schools and faculties of social work, right? We attempt to dismantle some of these structures, but very often our practices reinforces some of these structures. So Audre Lloyd, one of her famous quotes, she said that the master's tools would never dismantle the master's house. And I want to put forward the argument that perhaps at their times when social work in an attempt to dismantle a colonizing approach to social work or to white supremacy, we've been actually using colonial tools to try to dismantle the master's house, which in fact has been rebuilding the master's house. So white supremacy culture, it's what we call the taken for granted. So there's this, this story about these four junior fishes that were swimming do downstream and this senior fish was swimming upstream and he said to them, good morning boys, how's the water? And the junior fish looked perplexed at the senior fish and said, water, what's that, right? And this is what Berger and Lutkin talks about the taken for granted, the social construction of reality in which we are all born into and invite others to participate, right? So that structural racism, white supremacy culture and anti-black racism often operates and are effective because they become invisible, right? So from the cradle all the way until we leave this planet, we are continually being socialized to white supremacy as the norm and black exclusion as the norm, right? Through the media, through research, through religion, through pop culture, and all these other types of powerful socializing agents. So for me, you know, as I do this work, I think about, you know, the true focus of change, again, evoking the words of Audre Lloyd. Um, it's never merely the oppressive situations that we seek to change, but very often I'm asking myself, Dexter, by the decisions that I'm making as a social worker, or as an administrator, or as a teacher, how is that either dismantling a particular system, or how do I look at even addressing the oppressor that lives in me? All of us, particularly um, all of us who, who are socialized, in predominantly white institutions or in North America or across the world, we are socialized to the existence and the normalization of white supremacy culture. 
So we know the facts, social work, a, a child welfare domain that social work very much owns and has a lot of oversight in the United States, um, higher disproportionate number of black kids within these systems. You look at Latinx kids, and we know from, from many of you who work in these areas that they are represented in the child welfare system proportionately to their representation within the general population, right? Asian kids, very few of them in the system. Latinx kids, representative based on their proportion in the system. Black kids, overrepresented, right? In some places, two, three, four times overrepresented based on their population. And again, this is social work, right? This is what, what's happening in social work. So an intersectional analysis and why that is so important, right? And again, in terms of thinking about all the different dimensions that social work cares, cares for, and this is the addressing framework by Hayes, right? In terms of looking at the various aspects in which individuals often experience marginalization, age, developmental disabilities, gender, sexual orientation, religion, and so on. But when we do a black intersectional analysis, the pay gap, women earn on average 82 cents on the dollar compared to their black counterpart, to their, to, their, to their male counterparts. Black women earn 61 cents on the dollar. Look at immigration, all the talk we've had through this last administration in terms of how black and brown individuals, right, the S-hole countries, Mexicans and so on, their experience versus immigrants coming from Europe, disability, sexual orientation, Folks who are working in the area of HIV, um, in, in some American cities, uh, uh, black MSM are seven times more likely to report HIV infections compared to their white counterparts, although they engage in lower rates of sexual risk behaviors, right? The HIV paradox. So again, intersectional analysis focusing on black really peels away some of the hidden and not so hidden inequalities within the DEI framework. So I argue that a DEI framework without looking at a, a specific black intersectional analysis does not fully address the issue of anti-black racism, right? And, but, but these are the models that we predominantly use in social work in terms of uh, trying to address anti-black racism. So I wanna talk a little bit now about some transformative versus some performative strategies to address anti-Black racism. And this is a quote by James Baldwin. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Right? So when I think about um, addressing anti-Black racism in social work and the university is a microcosm of the larger society, right? The social work uh, faculties and the classrooms are also a microcosm of the larger society. So all the ideologies that we talked about in the larger society, it stands uh, reasonable to argue that many of these ideologies very often uh, proliferate, show themselves up, manifest themselves within the classroom, right? So let's talk a little bit about an anti-racist approach or an anti-Black racist approach, right? So looking as, as an active process of identifying and eliminating anti-Black racism or racism by changing the systems, organizational structures, policies, and practices. And we'll talk a little bit about what some of this looks like on the ground. But this is something that I found on um, on the internet, on Twitter, and I thought it was really quite amusing, but also very telling. It says, teach me about anti-Black racism, they say, but don't hurt my feelings, don't make me upset, don't talk about violence, don't allude to my privileges, don't be too academic, too bold, or too well-spoken, use don't use language that I'm unfamiliar with, and most importantly, never, never, ever contradict what I already believe, right? So, so it goes back to the fact that very often to address this, we have to move beyond our comfort zone. Um, like many of us, I've been having conversations with, with colleagues 
um, for the last two and a half decades since I've been in the academy, but more recently since last summer to a heightened degree. And very often I've had colleagues who've said to me, Dexter, you know, we have to get the programming just right. We have to get the curriculum just right. Um, you know, because we have to make sure we, we, we get it right before we act or go into the classroom. And I said, well, you know, that's a luxury that many of the families who are ending up in the child welfare system do not have because our students are acting even in the presence of us being silent and not doing anything. So we have to not sacrifice the good for the perfect. We have to act. We have to hold these difficult, uncomfortable spaces to have these conversations, right? We don't have the luxury of not acting. Not acting is a parallel form of violence. Right? So um, I, I know this group has done a lot of this work already in terms of um, moving from uh, a transformative to a performative st stance in terms of the individual growth, both collectively and individually, but moving away from the fear zone. Uh, the fact that you have 80 plus individuals now on this task force tells me that there is momentum, that people are moving beyond their comfort zone, right? Moving into a learning zone. And I'll talk a little bit in terms of the learning and the growth zone, what some of those opportunities might look like. So transformative versus performative allyship. And, you know, we all, you know, very, very, I'm sure clearly remember the events of last summer with Mr. George Floyd with his brutal ki killing. And, you know, there was a, a rush of uh, solidarity statements, right? And very often, if these are just statements, they're just performative. They're what I call racial insurance for some institutions, right? In terms of saying, we are on the good side of history. We, issue, we issued a statement, but how do we move from, from uh, performative measures to really true transformative allyship? So, so these are some of the areas in terms of comparing transformative versus performative. And you know, I, I'm sure some of the questions might, might come along um, around this area. I have this, this picture of, our latest Supreme Court justice here, because when we want to address some of these issues in terms of anti-Black racism or, or, or anti-racism um, in general, it's more than just putting a Black or a Brown person in positions of power or hiring a, a bunch of Black and Brown or racialized faculty, right? If we don't address the culture of an institution it does not change the institution. It does not dismantle white supremacy culture, right? In fact, bringing a bunch of diverse students, diverse faculty, diverse staff into an environment where we are not deliberately working on addressing the culture could actually be more harmful or more toxic for those individuals, right? So, it, so it's more than just changing the face of the leadership. So I love this quote here. It says, women in powerful positions aren't inherently feminists, especially when they use their power to harm more marginalized women, right? And as we know, um, you can have a person of color and it doesn't mean that they do not by their actions advance white supremacy culture, right? So we really have to address the issue around the culture of organizations. So let's talk a little bit in terms of what that looks like. So I've been giving a lot of thought to this. And, you know, I'm saying for the past two to three decades, we've been doing DEI training across many schools of social work. And what has the outcome been in terms of looking at the preparedness of our social work graduates to go out and practice using an anti-racist lens, um, using an anti-oppressive lens, isn't making a, a difference in terms of the disproportionate and continuous number of black kids who are going into the child welfare system because of biases around risk perception. 
is it making a difference in terms of uh, the mental health diagnoses that very often um, black and brown individuals uh, are particularly saddled with in terms of more harsh mental health diagnoses relative to their white counterparts? Is it really making a difference? The way that we are approaching DEI training, is it actually working? And I, I would suggest that we look at the evidence. So in terms of, you know, how do we think about approaching this from a different standpoint, reimagine DEI education and training, right? So it's, it's, it goes without saying that it's really important to the center whiteness in terms of not only elevating black voices, right? And addressing uh, racism in the profession and as well as outside the profession, but what would it be like for students of color if a professor came into the classroom and the first day of class acknowledged the fact that there's not only racism within the society, but that, that we are all inhabitants of society, that these attitudes also permeate, have permeated and do permeate social work policy, social work research, social work education, and acknowledge that from day one. Right. Very often, students of color left thinking, I have to convince someone that there's been a microaggression. I have to convince someone that there's racism in the system. Well, and that puts the weight of convincing on individuals and groups who are already marginalized, and in many cases, not as empowered as individuals in positions of power. So how do we even start introducing social work education in terms of not only talking about the sins of social work, and its contributions to dismantling the black families and other types of families. But how do we start a social work education by decentering and addressing racism and the history of racism within the, within the profession, right? And, and rather than focus on DEI, right? The real thing we need to focus on is white supremacy culture, which really brings the conversation and puts it at the lap of individuals in positions of power. So, you know, when I look at DEI committees and I see, you know, um, a committee that's comprised of mostly racialized individuals or, or sexual minority individuals, I was like, no, again, we are sending a colonial message here that DEI only is relevant to people who are marginalized, right? We need allyship. And we really need to shift the, the, the focus on individuals in power and not put it on individuals who are marginalized to teach, to educate, to move the needle, right? Whites, Blacks, powerful folks who are uh, not as empowered need to come together in order to, to, to address this issue, right? Moving away from this notion of equity deserving, equity seeking versus equity deserving. Right? And I think very often the language in social work has been around equity seeking versus equity deserving. Right? The latter evokes tokenism, seeking equity from who? Those who, have power to, those who have the power to bestow it and those who have the power to take it away. I think we need to really change the language. Language is important to framing a problem, but also framing a solution. So really moving away from equity seeking to equity deserving, right? Because very often when black and brown individuals show up in predominantly white institutions, elite institutions, they're viewed as interlopers, right? We are allowing you to come to the table, right? Versus you deserve to be at the table. Research is a big piece, right? So, you know, when I came into the academy two and a half decades ago, you know, I, I use the language that I was taught at risk communities, at risk youth. And, you know, arguably, I think that this sort of language, again, in a very subtle way, perpetuates the nar a colonial narrative around these youth. These youth are not at risk youth. They're living in at risk communities. They're living in at risk environments. These youth are not underachieving in terms of the achievement gap. There's a funding gap. Right? So it sounds minor, but it's really important in terms of shifting the narrative 
away from self-blame, from blaming individuals to looking at the structural inequalities in the environment. So you look at the prison industrial system, all right, disproportionate number of blacks, right? You look at, at policing in terms of the, the, the rate of individuals who are killed or have violent attacks um, at the hands of police. Um, it's a very different narrative for Latinx individuals, for Asian individuals, right? Uh, the, the level of uh, social oppression and social control experienced by Blacks is, is phenomenal, it's, it's exorbitant, right? So again, looking at the structures that embed this, um, our admissions policy. Um, when I was at the University of Chicago for two decades, we kept, you know, every year at, at orientation, um, leadership would say, well, you know, we have to do better in terms of the number of minority folks being admitted into the school. And, and invariably, there are other issues around financing and who could afford to be included and so on. But when we started looking at our admissions policy, revising it to make it more equitable, still focusing on GPA, but not privileging GPA above and beyond everything else, we saw a 15% increase in our uh, diverse number of students. When we looked into our data, we realized that white males, black males, Asian males, Latinx males were being offered um, admissions at approximately the same rate, but black males I know, were applying at approximately the same rate, but black males were being offered admissions 50% less than the other um, male groups, right? So we started looking at the data, looking at trends, and we revised our admissions process, and it led to an increase in terms of the number of black individuals admitted into the program. At the University of, of Toronto, in 1996, out of an incoming class of 250 medical students, there was one black individual. In 2018, several decades later, you had two individuals out of an incoming class of 250, right? Very often the notion around a pipeline issue has been raised. When the medical school decided to look at the admissions process, revise the admissions process, have individuals who identified as black and indigenous, have the applications read by community doctors, by racialized doctors, the admissions class in terms of black incoming students rose uh, to 50 individuals out of a class of 250. So it's not necessarily a pipeline issue, it's a perception issue. Right. So, so these are the ways in terms of also moving the DEI away from committee structure, embedding it into the work of all faculty working groups, which is something we, we've started to do this year at the University of Toronto. All right, so I just want to stop here. And um, this is the very, a very exciting part of this, this discussion to really take your questions and engage us as fellow colleagues around some of the some of the points, some of the issues, some of your thoughts. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, Professor Matz, would you like to um, see what questions we have in the chat box? I would, thank you so much, Dean Rosen. This was a wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you for sharing your personal experiences, your professional experiences, and really just giving us, um, you know, a really nice kind of solution focused approach to how we can um, you know, move forward anti-racist and particularly anti-Black racist uh, work in the social work profession and beyond. It was, it was really great. Um, please do submit um, your questions in the chat here. I will be, um, after I ask a couple of my own questions, I will be looking to the chat uh, to get your uh, questions. So please um, ask those and uh, I will pay attention to them. Uh, my name is Tina Matz, and I'm associate professor here in the School of Social Work. Um, and I'm just going to, um, you know, moderate these um, question and answers. And I'm just going to start off with my own question, if you don't mind. Um, so, Dean Voisin, um, you know, talking about kind of moving beyond 
self-reflexivity and moving into more structural changes um, to combat anti-Black racism and to um, dismantle white supremacy um, is extremely important. And it takes a long time to make structural changes, right? So um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on whether um, it's possible in the US to really move from performative allyship to transformative allyship. We've been in performative allyship, stuck there for so long, it seems, in, in the United States in general, but also in social work and academia. And so from your perspective, having also uh, being in Canada and having a very different uh, context there, do you think in the United States it's possible for us to really make that move? Or do you think that we're going to be staying in this performative stage? Um, what are your thoughts? Great, great question. And, and no questions are off the table. I, you know, I see this as, as I mentioned, a conversation among colleagues, a conversation among equals, but for us to, to really have a sort of unfiltered question. Well, um, Condoleezza Rice noted, she said that racism is America's birth defect. And, you know, I think about what that metaphor signals, right? A birth defect, you could never erase it, you could minimize it. And I think the issue of race and racism in America would never be eliminated. It depends to what degree we can minimize it, right? Again, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So to what extent could we ameliorate it? And I think there are, have been, yes, there are successful examples of that. So I, I mentioned, you know, there are many faculties of social work that are looking at the admissions policy, right? In terms of some schools who are getting rid of the GRE um, because of what we've known for a long time, it, it really very often, you know, taps into other things in terms of socioeconomic status or your familiarity with, with predominant culture and ideologies and so on. And um, folks have seen an increase in terms of admission numbers, right? Folks who've started to decolonize the admissions process in terms of not just focusing on GPA, but looking at lived experience and looking at letters of recommendation as part of a sort of conceptual examination of, of applications. Also looking about your commitment to working with different populations, your life experience, and how do we think about expertise and capital that the students are bringing to us, right? Um, those schools have seen a shift in terms of their own student body, right? Um, I think, you know, the presence of deans of color, myself included, in terms of top schools of social work, right? Where you had not seen that 10 or 15 years ago. But as I, as I said, it goes back to more than putting a person of color in a position, it's really dealing with, with, with the culture of the organization. So very often, you know, when folks are advertising for significant positions, they have this in leadership positions in the academy. Now folks are introducing this question and they're like, tell me what is your approach to EDI or how would you foster EDI within your organization, right? And I'm like, okay, this is an important question, not just for senior leaders, but it's an important question for all social workers, particularly the fact that social workers are dealing with many of society's most vulnerable. So rather than have just GPA as a criteria for graduation, you have to have a B plus or above to graduate. Why don't we start saying in order to graduate, you have to demonstrate cultural sensitivity in terms of how you would address anti-Black racism in social work. Why doesn't every social work student be held accountable to demonstrate that competency before they had given a social work degree? Why doesn't every social worker before they're hired ask them to articulate that, to demonstrate that, how they do that in their policy work, their practice work, their research work? I think, again, we've used a westernized approach. GPA is a criteria, but I think we need to expand that above and beyond training, above and beyond curriculum to look at exit competencies in a different way. It starts signaling to every social worker I have to dismantle 
the oppressor that lives inside of me, right? Um, and we have to own that and normalize that because we've all been socialized, indoctrinated by the same Western predominantly white ideology culture, black, brown, Latinx. So I think, I think there are ways we can build upon some of the good work that we've done. But now we've reached a point in social work where it's like an exercise, right? If you don't change up your exercise routine, you no longer start to, you, you have diminishing returns in terms of benefit, right? We have to change up our approach to addressing the, uh, DEI and particularly anti-racism within our curriculum, with, within competencies and within graduation, employment, within promotion within social service agencies, right? We have to think about it differently, much more expansive. Uh, uh, wonderful. Thank you for that response. In a related vein, um, you know, when folks kind of move from the performative uh, role to a more transformative role, oftentimes that is accompanied by a significant amount of backlash and pushback from, from people that can be very difficult, you know, at its extreme violence, but it could be, you know, somebody not being considered for a promotion or losing their job or, you know, being um, excluded from groups, um, you know, for um, trying to, um, you know, call in somebody for centering their whiteness or, you know, trying to um, really push back on people and, um, you know, raise uh, awareness around um, racial justice issues. So how can we support um, social work students, social work practitioners, um, staff, faculty in doing that work? What would that, what could that look like um, in really providing support so that people don't feel like they are putting themselves or, uh, you know, others at risk um, and feel supported in doing this work? Great question. And, and that's one reason why I put up those operational definitions around racist, racism, racist culture, white supremacist, white supremacy culture and ideology. You know, there are power differentials in organizations. And you're right. Sometimes if a white person calls out another white person around their white privilege, there could be a backlash, right? This is not just people of color calling out inequalities, right? It happens across the spectrum. And I think the important thing is, again, language is so important. It is so incredibly important because it frames how we look at a situation and it also frames this, the, the solution. And I think we have to move from calling people out to calling them in, right? When we call people out, I think people are petrified. Oh my God, the worst thing you can say is call me a racist or white supremacist. So that's why I'm saying if we need to shift the conversation away from the calling out, the name calling, identifying people in terms of pronouns to talking about this, normalizing conversations around this in terms of culture, it's all around us, right? As a person of color, there are times when I invariably make decisions that replicates and perpetuates white supremacy culture because that's what I've been born into, right? So if we normalize this, we take the sting out of it so that we can have these conversations, then people don't get defensive. A defensive person, when you push them, they push back. And either in a position of power, they push back hard because you, it raises anxiety and it's, a, it's an attention to sort of regulate the anxiety so that it pumps on you, right? So if we start shifting the conversation, normalizing it, right? When folks talk about, well, I wonder if there's a eruption in the classroom, somebody said something inappropriate. If we move away from looking at these eruptions to realize that social work has contributed to the eruptions in the larger society, in our history, in our practice, but we approach education with a deconstructionist lens, it, it sets up a very different type of conversation. And it sets up something that's more 
consultative and more inclusive. So very often I would have white colleagues who would say, Dexter, this is how I'm seeing this, but how do you see it? And I said, well, my perspective is limited. It's like looking through a keyhole. You only see a small slice of the room. And we all look through keyholes with the small slices of the room. But when we all bring those perspectives around the table, we see more of the 360, right? So I think, I think we have to start changing the approach from one of calling out to calling in. And that sets up how we start orienting students in the classroom, how we start introducing the topic, how we start acknowledging um, both uh, social workers as saviors or angels, but also sinners, right? How we start normalizing the complexity of our humanity. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now I'm going to uh, ask you some of the questions from the chat. So the first one is from Professor Susan Tone. In your experience, what are the components of anti-white supremacy training for social work faculty and staff? And you may have already partially answered this. Um, is it different than the training for students? Do you think that the training can integrate these two groups? I think it has to integrate the, the two groups because, you know, as educators, we are there to support students. And, you know, students have a particular pocket of expertise. They are also learners, but teachers. And instructors, we are also teachers, but learners. And again, it, th this is a very non-Westernized approach, right? Um, the hierarchical approach, the top-down approach, that's a very white Eurocentric approach in terms of knowledge transfer, right? This approach, Bell Hooks talks about that in terms of transformative education, right? The, 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 the horizontal and the vertical. So I think these conversations need to happen um, in tandem. Uh, it, it's sort of a collective sharing of expertise. And again, thinking about the expert, the teacher and the learner in, in more sort of bi-directional uh, complex ways. So, so it, to me, it absolutely has to take, in con, uh, take place in conjunction with, with students, not apart from students. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Professor Rothio Calvo. Um, what would you say are three essential measurable systemic changes that enable an institution to engage in transformative anti-racist work? Well, there are lots, but I think again, in terms of starting a culture of normalizing, right? Um, in order to have this sort of conversation, you, you, you need to have a critical mass of individuals. You can't have one black or brown or Asian person in the classroom, right? You need to have um, uh, a mixture of students uh, where folks can learn from each other um, and that the weight in terms of these conversations don't fall upon an N of one or an N of two. It, it, it also means, you know, promoting racial excellence in different ways, right? Moving it away from, from tokenism to normalizing it, right? So very often in institutions where you have one person checking the box in terms of diversity, one in this group, two in that group, one in that group, regardless of how excellent individuals are, it still sets up a narrative of tokenism, right? So one student, one colleague, white colleague said to me, Dexter, you know, I'm really happy. And this was what at, at a talk I was giving. It's really important for you to be here because as you give this talk, it's really important um, for students of color to see someone um, with your background in a position of leadership or a position of expertise. And I said, no, I see, again, that's our colonial socialization. I said, no, my, my presence here is not just for the benefit of black and brown students. It also benefits white students because it tells them that expertise shows up in non-white bodies. Right? But again, that's the subtle culture we've all been socialized that white experts could benefit white students, black and brown students, everyone else. But black experts are only there for the benefits of racialized students. Somehow their presence does not uplift or could touch white students, right? 
subtle, subtle distinction, but again, that's how we all sort of socialize to think, right? And I think being, uh, you know, being able to have those conversations without calling people out and, you know, saying, well, you know, I think another way to look at it is X, Y, and Z, right? We, we have to normalize and acknowledge our common humanity, which, is, which are our frailties and our blind spots. Uh, great. Now we probably have time for one, maybe two more questions, but this one is from Abby Wilson, who is a current student. What are some of the ways that students can better advocate for change within, uh, with the knowledge that large, well-known colleges and universities often feel the need to protect their reputation by not stirring the pot or making anybody upset, including their donors and alumni? Well, you know, we have to think about who we are and what we do as social workers, right? Um, you know, to use uh, your Dean's phrase that's borrowed from John Lewis, good trouble, right? Part of what we do as social workers is to create good trouble, right? And if we are there to just maintain the status quo, then we've drifted from our mission, right? And silence in terms of not addressing these means that all of us go out not as fully prepared to deal with the really complex issues that we are called upon to do as social workers and we end up replicating systems of exclusion and systems of oppression, right? So one person said, when I act, I'm afraid. When I'm quiet, I'm still afraid. Therefore, I've decided to act. And I'm not minimizing that to do this work takes real courage, right? But when we are silent, we become fearful. When we act, we become fearful. So you're gonna to have to deal with it. Why not act? The fear is still there, right? And you might do some real good in the world. And again, it's, 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 it's developing that skill set to be able to have those conversations, to call people into the conversation, not call them out. Thank you. I will uh, pose one additional question to you, if you don't mind, before we wrap up. Please. Uh, on MLK Day this year, this is from um, Schoon Carrington. On MLK Day this year, the APA issued an apology and acknowledged past practices and events in psychiatry that contributed to racial inequity in their contributions to structural racism, including subjected persons of African descent and indigenous people who suffered from mental illness to abusive treatment, experimentation, victimization in the name of scientific evidence. How do social workers begin to make amends? Well, again, in terms of addressing that in the classroom, right? So like in, in Canada, we have a land acknowledgement. Anytime you, 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 you give a talk, you sort of acknowledge that the land that you, you stand on is not your land. It comes from the uh, indigenous people of Canada, right? That is acknowledging genocide, is acknowledging uh, colonial trauma, it's acknowledging a lot, right? Um, and, you know, I think it would be great in the US if more of those acknowledgements happen. You know, it's a start. It's an acknowledgement that, listen, you are acknowledging the fact that, um, you know, although I'm an American, I may, I may be living in the shadows of the stars and stripes. Although I'm an American, I may be coming from a community that hasn't been touched by the prosperity that has touched your community, right? Again, that's sort of humanizing. It, it, it doesn't put people having to now say, listen, I have to convince you. It's being acknowledged by individuals in, in, in positions of power, which sends a strong message, right? But it cannot end there, that's a start, right? We have to thread all those things throughout the different systems and keep that conversation alive. Not when we have, just when we have a George Floyd incident. We have to make it as part of the, the, the commonplace practice of social work. Well, Dean Vazan, this was uh, wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your your work with us and your thoughts with us tonight um, and for being willing to answer um, all of our questions. 
Thank you to those who submitted questions. I'm sorry to those who I wasn't able to get to. Um, we, uh, we will keep a record of these questions and um, we will be as a school looking through them um, to see kind of the, the different questions that folks um, have and what, what was on their mind um, during this talk tonight. Uh, Dean Fozan, you're welcome to stay for the rest of the program tonight uh, or welcome to do not, <laughs> however your time permits. Uh, we're going to move on to the awards um, portion of our program tonight, and I'm going to pass it right on to Cindy Snow. Thanks, Tina. Um, I, I always appreciate this evening. Um, it's such a great opportunity for the greater um, Boston College School of uh, Social Work community to come together um, and have um, very interesting conversations and, and co questions posed. Um, I thank you all for also um, celebrating our Distinguished Alumni Award winners uh, this evening. Um, each year, our uh, wonderful alumni board uh, solicit nominations um, and encourage um, people to put forth uh, the wonderful alumni that contribute to the field of social work. And the board has the privilege of reading through those nominations and hearing about the wonderful things our alums do, and also the challenging uh, position of, of choosing only two alumni award winners each year. Each year we have uh, uh, two distinguished alumni awards, one that goes to an alum five to 10 years out, and another that goes to an alum 10 years or more. This year's winners are um, Sheru Stokes Williams, who graduated from the PhD program in 2011, and Charlene Luma, who graduated from the Master's of uh, Social Work degree program in 2005. Um, our first winner, um, Sheru, is um, living currently in uh, Turkey, and her nominator is also living um, overseas. So their two messages have been pre-recorded, and we will hear from them now. Good evening, faculty, staff, and alumni. Dean Yadama and esteemed guest speaker, Professor Wilson. Cindy, thank you for the introduction. I feel welcomed and humbled to be part of this ceremony, even though I cannot be live due to COVID confinement conditions and time difference between Boston and the Principality of Andorra. Tonight, we are honoring two of our alumni that are making extraordinary contributions to solve the most intractable problems of our day by working with individuals, families, communities, and systems to reduce suffering, promote well-being, and catalyze social change locally and globally. It's my honor to introduce to you Major Sheru Stokes, my friend, greatest colleague in global social work, Boston College PhD graduate in social work, class of 2012, and this year's recipient of the recent Graduate Distinguished Alumni Award. After receiving her PhD, Sheru chose a non-traditional path compared to most PhD graduates to serve her country as a military officer in the United States Air Force. She has been based in North Dakota, South Korea, Hawaii, Nebraska, and currently in Turkey. In North Dakota, Sheru started as a captain, as a clinical social worker at the largest Department of Defense nuclear security base. Her roles included the alternate family advocacy officer and the alternate disaster mental health treatment chief. At Kunsan Air Base in South Korea, she was the alcohol and drug abuse prevention and treatment manager. Her roles also included acting as the alternate mental health clinic officer in charge, the sexual assault program medical group point of contact, and the disaster mental health team chief. After Korea, she was stationed in Hawaii as a major. She was the director of psychological health. Within this position, she was also the resiliency element officer in charge, the family advocacy program liaison, the alternate mental health clinic officer in charge, 
the ultimate alcohol and drug abuse prevention and treatment program manager, the sexual assault program medical group point of contact, and the disaster mental health team, uh, mental health team chief. Between 2018 and 2020, Shuru served in Omaha, Nebraska, where she was the subject matter expert in primary care behavioral health at the largest Department of Defense Family Medicine residency program. During her time in Nebraska, she excelled as the behavioral medicine faculty member, teaching family medicine doctors common mental health diagnosis in primary care and introducing them to integrated primary care behavioral health treatment. In her new leadership position, Shavru is the flight commander in the mental health clinic at Inkerik Air Base in Adana, Turkey. She oversees and directs mental health treatment and outreach of 3,000 beneficiaries, which include service members, retirees, contractors, and Turkish personnel. I hope you kept up with all of that, all of that moving around the world and the diversity of roles and responsibilities. But this is Shuru. She really does not shy away from crossing borders or cultures in her quest to serve. Shuru's accomplishments and dedication to serve others in mental health is commendable. The career that she has carved with the support from her mentors, her friends and family is personally inspirational. What has struck me about Shuru that day we met for the first time on the PhD lounge and what continues to impress me is her openness. Her openness to hear and truly listen, to acknowledge the perspectives of others, to seek the positive, the strengths and possibilities. During our heated debates in policy class, Shuru was the one that inspired us to achieve understanding through dignity and respect. This embodiment of social work's principles and ethics is what is catapulting Shibu into leadership and excellence in her career in the Air Force and beyond. More personally, Shibu was the cohort member that made me feel welcome in the United States and her warm friendship and support helped me to develop a sense of belonging in Boston, a city culturally very far removed from my own. She also helped me embrace PhD training challenges and grow in the PhD program while facing the intensity of the program herself. Her insight and own personal experience and good mentoring helped me find my own mentors that guided and supported me through graduation and into my postdoc in global health and social medicine at Harvard. Sheru and I share a deep dedication to global social work, social justice and welfare to contribute to positive change beyond the walls of academia and the borders of our own country. Ashiru is acknowledged tonight for her excellent work. I hope that not only her career, but also her personhood, how she truly embodies the principles of social work will inspire others to be open, open to paths that seem challenging, yet adventurous at times, and thereby be truly open towards excellence. I'm honored to introduce to you my friend, Major Shuru Stokes. We will now hear the video from Shuru herself. Mahaba which means hello in Turkey. I wanted to be there live with all of you tonight, but due to the time difference between Boston and Turkey, I had to send a free recording. This is a great honor and privilege to be chosen as this year's recent Boston College Alumni Award winner. So to start off, I wanna tell you a little bit about my friendship with Renee Carapina, my mentor. We met our first year of the doctoral program and I learned that she was from South Africa. South Africa holds a special place in my heart as I was a US Peace Corps volunteer there during a new post-apartheid society in 1999 through 2001. As the third group of volunteers to South Africa, we were still pioneers representing Peace Corps of America. I remember how the trans 
the, I remember how the country was transforming right in front of our eyes. And similarly, I was transforming too as this change inspired me to learn more about myself and my own cultural identity. And South Africa is one of the most beautiful places I have ever been and so much of the country I was able to explore. I love my time living and working among the Shitsonga people in Limpopo province. The experience changed my life and I am forever grateful. It fueled my passion for traveling, experiencing different cultures and opportunities that exist to live and work abroad. My global perspective and international development interests began. With this in common, in global, with this in common interest in global work and development perspective, Renee and I immediately became friends. I would often talk to her about her country and how it changed my life and how much the experience living in Africa was one of the best experiences of my life. While in South Africa, I decided to pursue a career in social work. I met social workers who were instrumental in during the HIV and AIDS epidemic. They worked in hospital clinics, government agencies, and I thought social workers do everything and work everywhere. This is what I want to do. And I knew I wanted to live and work abroad again. And more importantly, I wanted to be globally conscious. So Renee, thank you for your friendship and for reminding me how much South Africa changed my life, direction in life, and led me to where I am today. For this award, there's so many things about Boston College School of Social Work experience has had on my career. My time at BC was incredibly challenging and rigorous, but I learned so much and I wanted for what I wanted for my future. My mentors, some who are still faculty there, my dissertation chair, Professor McCory and Professor Lombe, were supported. I always felt they cared about my well-being and growth as a future researcher, academic, and colleague. I loved the challenge intellectually, and I enjoyed collaborating with faculty on their research interests. And I co-authored articles, attended conferences, and recognized how important staying current in the field in research and policy is. This is something I still do today as I contribute and remain relevant in social work. I work together now with my academic colleagues on papers. I also teach online an MSW course. And I also remember taking Professor McGinnis Dietrich's teaching course while in the program and how it assisted in my teaching pedagogy. Now, as I reflect on my time in Boston College School of Social Work, I feel so fortunate and blessed. Initially, when I decided to serve after graduating, I did because growing up in a military family, my dad was in the Marine Corps, there was some respect I wanted to give to him who has since passed away. He made his entire adult career in the Marine Corps as an enlisted member. And I never aspired for a military career, but I remember as a young child, he spoke so highly of the Air Force and told me if I ever decided to join, to only join the Air Force and only join as an officer, because in his mind, he felt they were the best branch and treated the women the best. So when this opportunity presented itself, I thought, okay, this is my opportunity. I won't do this later in life. And I also wasn't 100% sure if academia was the direct path, which for most graduates um, is. So I kept my options open my last year and I actually had a tenure track position in Wisconsin and at the last minute I called the dean to let him know I decided to serve the military. And I was also nervous to tell my advisors and mentors in the program, but when I did, I felt they were so supportive and still mentored me and I am very grateful for that. And I didn't ever really imagine that my path would be for this long. I thought maybe try it initially for three years and then return to academia. But like my experience in South Africa, I discovered how much I loved it. There is so much adventure, challenge, and traveling. And I never knew that these opportunities existed for social workers in the military. It's definitely not a stagnant career and it is ever changing with an abundance of leadership opportunities and professional development. More importantly, I think it's amazing to be at the forefront of mental health and for active duty members and their families. And I feel this career has meaning and depth. 
As a military officer, I've also been able to work and live abroad, first to South Korea and now in Turkey. And never would I have thought, imagine these opportunities while I was still in the PhD program. I see now that my education not only prepared me for this career, but assisted in it. I have been able to have assignments where I directly use my PhD education. While at Nebraska, I taught family medicine residents as the behavioral medicine faculty at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. I did not even know such opportunities existed for PhD social work graduates. Teaching family medicine residents, both military and civilian physicians, on the primary care behavioral health model, beha well, behavioral medicine, well, wellness, all of which were because of my education and training. And the, those two years were probably one of the most memorable experiences of my military career. Now as a flight commander, I oversee programs which include mental health, family advocacy, alcohol and substance abuse, and outreach. There's so much about Boston College School of Social Work that I reflected on and wanted to share with you today that were meaningful in my accomplishments for this award. But the most important one I want to leave you with is that the mentors I had are central to me achieving this today. I did not achieve these successes without their support and guidance. And I may eventually return to academia after the Air Force, and I'm confident that I will be able to make that transition successfully. So thank you to all of the faculty, especially my dissertation chair, Dr. Ruth McCrory, and also my advisor, Dr. Margaret Lombe. And thank you for the school for giving me that opportunity. And sincerely, thank you, Renee, for recognizing my experiences and accomplishments. You are one of my dearest and closest friends. How wonderful to be able to include uh, both of those people in this uh, remote um, event. Um, I'd like to turn now to um, Paul Heithouse, who has nominated our next Distinguished Alumni Award winner. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Dean Ayudama. Congratulations to both of our recipients th this evening. Um, and thank you to my fellow alumni board members for giving me the opportunity to introduce Charlene Luma this evening as one of our distinguished alumni award recipients. Charlene is a graduate of Boston Latin High School, Boston College, and the Boston College School of Social Work. As a social worker, she has spent her career working in some of Boston's highest risk neighborhoods, doing what I consider to be some of the hardest work in the field. I first met Charlene when I was a second year social work intern with the Youth Service Providers Network. Charlene had graduated from BC that previous spring and YSPN was her first job in the field where she worked out of the C-11 police station in Dorchester as a street level social worker and, and clinician. After my internship and graduation, I accepted a full-time social work job with YSPN. Most of the staff at YSPN were uh, were young in both age and experience in the social work field, and we leaned on each other for support. As I learned as I learned of the job and struggled to find my place as a clinician working in a Boston Police Department, I found myself trying to model my practice on what I observed of Charlene. While, uh, while I am sure that she was managing through similar struggles, she always carried herself with a sense of confidence and support and comfort. During my time working with Charlene, she would introduce me to some of the Jamaican restaurants around Dorchester, and I would take advantage of those lunches uh, to learn more about her approach, uh, about her approach uh, to the work. My time working with Charlene was relatively short, but thanks to the power of social media, I've been able to follow her career. It has been a career dedicated to ensuring that the voiceless in Boston have an advocate. With YSPN, the SMART team, and the Boston Trauma Response, she has helped young people and their families navigate personal and community violence, trauma and loss in the criminal justice system. And so it was no surprise to me when she was recently named uh, the chief of the Suffolk County uh, District Attorney's Office Victim Witness Department under District Attorney Rachel Rollins. I spent 12 years studying at Jesuit institutions, so I feel I can comfortably say that Charlene not only represents the best of the social work field, 
but also the best of what Jesuit model education has to offer. So thank you, Charlene, and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. I appreciate that. Um, I want to first thank um, Boston College School of Social Work. It is my honor to accept the 2021 Distinguished Alumni Award. And I actually have it right here. Excited about that. Um, it was a pleasure to hear from Dean Boisin and um, congratulations to my co-honoree, Sheru Stokes Williams. And thank you to my family, friends, classmates, colleagues, current and former MSW interns for joining in this celebration tonight. To receive this award as we still bask in the aftermath of the swearing in of Madam B Vice President Harris on the first day of Black History Month during Boston College School of Social Work's Equity, Justice and Inclusion event makes this award even more meaningful to me because my drive for doing this work is centered around equity, justice and inclusion, and ultimately giving people the opportunity to have a voice to be seen and heard. In 2003, as a young 18 year old from Boston, I'm sorry, that was 1999, um, when I um, arrived at Boston College, um, I, I wasn't sure kind of um, what to expect. To be honest, some would say I ended up at Boston College by accident and others would say it was fate. As I was applying to colleges, I had all intentions of leaving the state. I was totally convinced I was gonna be out of Massachusetts. Um, but because Boston College had hosted a college fair I'd attended, I figured at 17, why not apply there? And so here we are. My initial experience at Boston College was an overwhelming one. I was not only adjusting to what many students do their first year, living on campus, having more responsibilities, adapting to college, um, the college life and workload, working part time and making new friends. But I also was nine months, months into a new diagnosis of lupus, which is an autoimmune disease in which your body attacks itself. For me, that meant fatigue, pain, and being really thoughtful about how I spent my time and many doctor's appointments. But more so than any of those things, the biggest adjustment I faced was feeling small. Boston College in some ways solidified how small I was in the world, being that when you are small, it is easy to be overlooked, not seen, forgotten, and there's uncertainty of how and where you fit in. For people of color, Black people, this is often reality every day. But especially for Black people in cities like Boston, where race, equity, justice, and inclusion issues were evident in our schools, communities, law enforcement, and the healthcare systems. I learned this especially when I was enrolled in Boston College's PULSE program. The PULSE program educates students about social injustice and puts them in direct contact with marginalized communities in and around Boston. I was placed at an organization in Mission Hill that served high-risk youth and their families. I had the opportunity to work with young people in various capacities and they would often come in and talk about the violence and injustices in their communities, as well as their treatment by adults, challenges at home, and essentially how small they felt. It was striking to me how the youth and I had parallel experiences. In some ways you could say I was privileged. I was attending Boston College, a premier institution. I had some finan um, financial means to actually stay in Boston College. I could easily access food, healthcare, and transportation but many of the youth did not. My smallness was centered around feeling I was chasing up, chasing to catch up to my white peers at Boston College because they were afforded many different opportunities that I had not been provided due to long-term systemic injustices. This was not much different from what the youth were experiencing. I soon found that I developed a desire to help youth be heard and seen and develop a sense of worth and placement in the world. And this eclipsed the sense of smallness I felt and gave me fulfillment. This is where I first began my journey into social work without even knowing it had begun. Throughout under, my undergrad career, at several jobs, including one at an after school program working with youth whose families had um, been impacted or involved by the Department of Children and Families. 
There, my passion for working with young people developed and I was able to see firsthand what a social worker did. When senior year approached, the decision to what to do next dominated my thoughts. I, can't, I kept landing on my experiences at the after school program and the Pulse program. The young people and their disparities that they face, the lack of diversity in individuals that serve them, the violence in communities, my community, lack of resources, and the social workers I interacted with, and the fulfillment I received from helping others, using my voice, and the decision soon became clear. Social work is where I would end up. I applied to Boston College School of Social Work and anxiously waited for the decision. And on April 1st, 2003, I walked into McKinley to, um, sorry, McGuinn to go to the admissions department to find out the status of my application. Walking down the hall, I ran into Dean Bill Howard and said he, he said he would assist me. I said to him my name. I said, my name is Charlene Luma and I'm trying to find out the status of my application. And he looks at me and says, oh, Charlene, you've been accepted um, and should be receiving a letter soon. And I looked at him and said, how do you know? And I was like, okay, okay, it's April Fools. You're playing games with me. He said, no, seriously, you got in, look for the letter. And so I quickly ran back to my dorm and waited for my letter. And lo and behold, I was accepted. You can imagine how embarrassed I was when I received the letter and when I realized who Dean Howard was. And that is truly how my social work journey began. Boston College School of Social Work has provided me the foundation to understand what it really meant to be a social worker. Not just what some may think, the people that take away children, but really it's about seeing individuals as whole people, being client-centered, the importance of self-determination, how a strong relationship can be transforming, leading with compassion, care, and empathy. It is not the job to fix people, but to guide and support them. And finally, helping people be seen, heard, and not feel small in the world. I have taken these principles with me and integrated them into the work I have done throughout my career and utilized them in my role as an MSW intern supervisor over the past 10 years. My journey in social work school has been transformative. I've learned where I fit in and a bit of that smallness transformed into empowerment. I left not only knowing how I wanted to dedicate my career and I wanted to be working in Boston with those impacted by the criminal justice system, but I also learned how to contribute to others in a way that's meaningful. I would also later learn that I can also help people be seen, heard, and no longer be small in the world. My career has focused on forensic social work and trauma, primarily working with those that have been the most impacted by the criminal justice system, black and brown individuals. I have found opportunities to do that work in various capacities, including working in the police station with youth criminally involved, servicing those impacted by domestic violence, working with clients in prison, providing therapy, launching a program that provide trauma services to homicide survivors, and now working at the district attorney's office. Those that I've worked with over the years have experienced significant trauma and violence. The common thread amongst many of them and amongst those you encounter in that, um, who have had those experiences is that when someone is in the midst of crisis trauma or just experiencing life challenges, there are often feelings of disempowerment and being invisible. As a social worker, those are the times that I lean on the foundation of skills I learned in grad school. This also allows me to see strength, resiliency, and humanity in those that I work with. This is what guides me day to day. I would like to end my address by addressing the MSW students and those thinking about becoming social workers. I want you to know that your work is impactful the work that you do can be transforming. Please remember to be good to yourself. Take care of yourself because this field needs you. Thank you for the award. Charlene, thank you so much. Uh, it's so wonderful that you've been recognized for the hard work that you've done and to hear your story is very inspiring. Thank you. Well, Charlene, um, 
and Charu, I want to congratulate you again. You make us proud, but you also inspire us to do better than we have done by you. Because I'm sure we were, you know, as a school, um, did quite well as you and Sharu have spoken, but we could do better. And I think this is part of the challenge of having graduates such as you both not only show us how we have done and where we have done right, but where we could do better. And we want to thank you on behalf of the faculty, staff, and current students. One more thing, your talk to the students uh, to do better and to be, to be really uh, strong in understanding that as MSW graduates, they'll have an impact. I want to add to them saying that you and Charu are the impact that they're seeing. And I think that is a wonderful testimony for what graduates of the school are able to do in the communities. And I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. I'm you know, sorry that it's an hour and a half and we couldn't get everyone's questions, but we also needed to see these examples that Charlene and Charu have set for ourselves to rise to those challenges that they are every day dealing with. And I know that, I mean, I've met many of the current graduates and recent graduates. They are equally capable and will be joining your ranks very soon. And it is my hope and dream that we would be producing more Charlene's and Charu's in the years to come. Thank you so much to everyone and to our honorees, Charlene and Charu, again, and to Dr. Dexter Voison for inspiring us with his uh, talk and for Professor Tina Matz for moderating it. Thank you, good night. And unfortunately, this is how we had to do it. But next year, we hope that we can all be together in person. Thank you so much. Good night.